Hello, I'm Dr. Susan Connolly, consultant cardiologist and clinical lead for the Our Hearts, Our Minds program for cardiovascular health. Today, I want to talk to you about understanding cardiovascular disease and cover the essential facts that we all should know. I'm going to explore the terminology that especially we as healthcare staff use that can be confusing. I want to talk about cardiovascular disease, why it develops and how it can be treated. I want to talk about what is a heart attack, what is angina. And lastly, I want to finish with describing how you can take charge of your heart condition. Here are some of the different terms healthcare staff use to describe cardiovascular disease and it can be very confusing. Hardening of the arteries, atheroma, plaque, cardiovascular disease, blocked artery, coronary stenosis. You may have heard these terms when you were in the hospital or you may have seen them in the letters we have sent to your GP. I want to try and break down what these terms mean because they're all essentially describing the same thing. The human body is supplied by arteries. They pump blood around the body and bring oxygen to all the organs. You can see on the right what a normal artery looks like and it has three layers. The inner layer or the intima, the middle layer or the media, and the outer layer, which is the adventitia. On the left, you can see the human body, and in red, you can see the arterial system. And in many ways, it's analogous to a tree. The main artery branches out into smaller arteries and even smaller arteries. So cardiovascular disease or arterial disease can occur in any of these arteries or more than one artery at once. But what do I mean by atherosclerosis or cardiovascular disease? This is the cross section of a coronary artery. And you can see that there's been a build up under the lining of the artery. This build up is composed of cholesterol, inflammatory cells, and other tissue. And this forms an atherosclerotic plaque. That plaque can progress and grow and become calcified. And if it narrows enough of your artery, generally about 70%, then you can develop symptoms of angina. Angina refers to chest discomfort uh, that happens when you walk and goes away when you stop. It can occur with emotional distress also. Here you can see the investigation of choice in a patient who has symptoms suggestive of angina. The first line test we do is a cardiac CT and some of you watching this will have had a cardiac CT. It's a very easy test, it takes about 10 minutes and it's non-invasive, meaning we don't have to stick any tubes into any arteries. We inject some contrast dye into a vein and that lights up the arteries in your heart. You can see on the left side of the panel, this is the picture we get with the cardiac CT. Where the arrow is pointing to, you can see very dense white material. This is calcium, and where there's calcium, there's plaque. This patient's cardiac CT suggested they had a significant narrowing in their artery from plaque. And therefore, we went on to do a coronary angiogram, which you can see on the right. This is an invasive test, which means we inserted a small tube, usually into the artery in your wrist. And now we're injecting, injecting dye directly into the heart. The dye lights up the arteries. And again, you can see where the arrow is, that there's a narrowing in the middle part of the artery. This patient, when they're sitting doing nothing, feel fine as they have enough blood supply. But once they start to exert themselves, the heart has to work harder and the artery can't expand because of the narrowing. So it can't bring the necessary blood flow to the muscle and that's what causes the discomfort. Now let's look what else can happen to plaque as it develops. In the last slide, we saw how plaque can progressively 
narrow the artery, causing angina. But sometimes plaque can cause trouble and they're not narrowing the artery. Here you can see on the left, plaque build up again. The plaque in many ways is a bit like a creme brulee. It's hard on top, but gooey and soft on the inside. And in some patients, that hard top can crack. And we call that plaque rupture. And your body's response to that plaque rupture is like when you cut your hand or your finger and you clot it. And now you can see there's a blood clot building quite quickly on top of the ruptured plaque. And it is the clot, the blood clot that blocks the artery. When the artery is completely blocked, that causes a lack of oxygen to the muscle beyond the artery. And that's when the patients experience chest pain at rest or a myocardial infarction or heart attack. This is important because a heart attack means there has been cell death, death of the tissue or muscle in the heart. The size of the heart attack can be very variable and patients can have very small ones or very large ones. Generally speaking, we like to see people as soon as possible as that prevents uh, large heart attacks from happening. There are two types of heart attacks, non-ST elevation MIs and ST elevation MIs. And you will see this terminology in your letters. How do we treat a heart attack? Well, usually we bring the patient to the cardiac catheterization laboratory, insert a tube in the wrist, feed a longer tube up into the heart, and then we pass a balloon and a stent, and we open up the artery in this fashion. Let's take a look at an example. This patient had an acute myocardial infarction, a STEMI. And on the left of the screen, in panel A, you can see his artery is completely blocked. This patient was brought to the cath lab. He had severe chest pain. And the cardiologist inserted a stent. And on the right of the panel, in panel B, you can see now the artery is wide open again and blood flow has been restored to the muscle. Typically at this stage, the patient's chest pain will ease and they will feel substantially better. The cardiologist has also prevented a large amount of damaging, damage occurring to the heart muscle. The other type of MI is a non-STEMI. In non-STEMIs, the artery tends to remain open. On the panel on the left, you can see the artery is wide open, but there are severe narrowings. So there is clot in here, but there is some blood flow getting through. These type of MIs, we do treat the same way, but there isn't the same time urgency to bring the patient to the cath lab. And we generally recommend it within 48 hours of symptoms. Now let's talk about stable angina caused by progressive narrowing. How do we treat that? Well, the mainstay of treatment is actually medication. Aspirin, statin, a tablet to relieve angina. And yes, we can put a stent in, but it's important to remember stents in angina do not reduce your risk of dying and do not reduce your risk of heart attack. Stents in an acute heart attack situation are life-saving. It is not the case in stable angina. And it's really important you adopt the lifestyle changes and take optimal medical therapy if you have angina. If your symptoms persist, you can talk to your cardiologist about a stent. Surgery is happening less frequently because interventional cardiologists have really progressed their techniques but still some patients go on to have coronary artery bypass surgery. That is more common if you have diabetes or if you've extensive narrowings or a narrowing in a very important artery. I see patients in clinic all the time after a heart attack or after they've had a stent and the questions are very similar. Why did this happen to me? 
Am I fixed? Will it happen again? And a big fear is, I was told one of my arteries was 50% blocked. Does it need a stent? Am I going to need a stent in future? So let's talk about that. The first question is, why did this happen to me? And I think it's really important to look into the patient's history to see why it did happen. Because if you can explain it to the patient on why they developed this, then they know they can control it and prevent it coming back. So firstly, there are non-modifiable risk factors. These unfortunately are risk factors you can do nothing about. If you're male, if you're of certain ethnicities, such as South Asian descent, if you're older, and some people have genetic predisposition, particularly if it's in their family, in their father before they were 55 or in their mother before they were 65, that tends to mean the offspring or the children at an increased risk for genetic reasons. There's no specific genetic test though we can do to check for this. It's important just to treat the heart disease as we treat all the other cases. Let's talk about modifiable risk factors and the good news is they far outweigh the non-modifiable risk factors. So there's plenty we can do to help. Being sedentary, carrying extra weight, particularly around your, your middle, eating a poor diet, high in processed food, low in fresh food and fruit and vegetables, smoking, poor psychological health, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. These are all the things that contribute to heart disease. And these are the things that we can modify. Another question I get is, will this happen again? The answer really is that depends. On average, one in four patients within five years will have another hospital admission with chest pain or heart attack or stroke or die. The death rate is very low and the more common event is another heart attack. But this risk is very variable from patient to patient and it can vary from as low as 1 in 10 to as high as 7 in 10. And why is this risk so variable? It's because of these modifiable risk factors. And somewhat surprisingly, only 1 in 10 patients with heart conditions lead optimal healthy lifestyles after their heart attack. Half of those who smoke before their heart attack continue to smoke. Only half are regularly physically active and less than half are eating an optimal diet. These are things that we can help you change. Let's look at Mr. F. This was a patient who came to see me. He was a taxi driver and he had a heart attack and he was treated with a stent to his right coronary artery. He was a smoker at the time, but thankfully it stopped but he was sedentary, he was overweight, and he had a history of high blood pressure. And his main question is, what is my risk, doctor? Is this going to come back? On the left panel, you can see his angiogram. <coughs> this is a picture of his left coronary artery, not where the stent was put in. And actually, it looks pretty good. There are no narrowings. So this patient would have been told in hospital, you have a stent in one artery, the other artery on the other side of the heart looks pretty good. But this patient, for a different reason, also had a cardiac CT. Now this is the really important bit. The cardiac CT you can see on the right side of the screen. You can see a lot of white material in an artery. This is the same artery that you're seeing in the angiogram. But now you know from the previous slides that where this white material is, there's plaque. This plaque is sitting in the wall of the artery, so it shows up on the CAT scan, but it's not showing up in the angiogram. The point is, even if your angiogram shows no significant narrowings, you can have a lot of plaque in the wall of your arteries. We can't treat that with stents. That won't work. There's no narrowing. So what we have to do 
is stabilize the plaque, prevent it from growing and prevent it from cracking. And actually, that's very achievable. So what we need to do together is work on stopping the plaque growing and even shrinking plaque. A lot of times patients ask me, well, can't we clean out my arteries? A bit like I'm blocking a pipe. And no, we can't. But we can stop this disease, this plaque in its tracks. We can hold it back and we can even shrink it if we're aggressive enough. This is about you taking control of the plaque in your arteries and thus ensuring you never come back into the hospital or have another heart attack. How can you do this? These are the most effective ways. Don't smoke. Eat a healthy Mediterranean type diet. And Donna, our dietitian, has done a video explaining exactly how to do this. Be regularly physically active. And Annette, our physiotherapist, explains how to do this in her video. Know your numbers. Know what your blood pressure is. Know what your cholesterol is. Ask your doctor. Ask your nurse. And control it. Ideally, your blood pressure in clinic should be less than 140 over 90 millimetres of mercury, or if measuring it at home, it should be less than 135 over 85 millimetres of mercury. Control your bad cholesterol, your LDL cholesterol, and the new target is less than 1.4, which is low. And lastly, but very importantly, take your tablets. Take them every day and take them at the right doses. That might seem a very obvious thing, but we know from studies that 50% of patients can stop their medications at one year. Let's look at what stabilizes plaque. So I've described to you the key actions. Here in the picture of the plaque, you can see we can either do two things. One, stop it growing, plaque stabilization. And two, if we're extra aggressive, we can even shrink it. And the measures are all the things I talked about. Not smoking, being active, eating well, controlling your cholesterol, taking your tablets and controlling your blood pressure. Having a heart condition can have a devastating impact. But I want to remind you actually prognosis for heart disease has changed enormously over the last 20 years. It is now a chronic disease, something that you can live with, something that you can control, and it should no longer define you. So be optimistic. Thank you.